Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and our next instalment of the most detailed series. In this video, we're once again stepping away from the smaller objects within the Halo universe to tackle something altogether a little larger. Today, we're looking at the lifeblood of the UNSC Navy, a smaller, nimble ship that still packs a hell of a punch, and when commanded in a well-coordinated task force, can and has frequently bested Covenant ships of similar and larger tonnage. It's a ship designed with planetary defence in mind, hence its powerful armament, and with its excellent balance between fleet support and troop transportation, it makes a highly versatile ship and integral to the UNSC's military and strategic prowess. Today, we're looking at the UNSC Stoward class frigate. As this is a ship, we will be opting to look at her overall exterior, hull and superstructure, and then analyse her from stem to stern, looking at each of the three major hull sections. The lore regarding this vessel is substantial, but there are areas where information is sparse. I will use references from Halo Warfleet, Halopedia, in-game lore, and information from the books to flesh out as much as humanly possible, but there will inevitably be some areas that a degree of speculation will take place. However, when these arise, I will notify you as such and use known principles of science and technology offset by my qualifications and knowledge of material science and technology. So with that in mind, let's get started. Now before we get into it, you may or may not already be aware, but currently some of the worst bushfires in living memory are raging across Australia's southeast right now. 23 people have been killed and 6 people are still missing, and hundreds of thousands of people have been evacuated from their homes. That's not to mention all the devastating effect this is having on uh, all of the wildlife in the area as well. It's a horrible situation, and to the families who have lost loved ones, my heart is broken for your loss. In the description you will find links to help support the firefighters bravely putting their lives on the line to get these fires under control, to help the family suffering through this tragedy, and to help the wildlife affected by these fires. Take a moment to pop below and uh, help out in any way you can. Now, back to the Halo content. The Starwood class light frigate is an escort ship type in service with the UNSC Navy. Manufactured by Sino via heavy machinery on reach, these frigates are designed with the hull code FFG. The Starwood class are used primarily in fleet escort duties, providing screens for larger capital ships. Designed with planetary defence in mind, Starwood frigates have proven successful due to their superb balance between fleet support and troop transportation. Designed by distinguished naval engineer David Pulver and Dr. Eugene Taylor, the Stalwart class light frigate was one of the most prominent classes of frigate in service with the UNSC Navy during the Human Covenant War. In service as early as 2531, several Stalwart frigates were part of Admiral Preston Cole's third fleet towards the end of the Harvest Campaign. On February 9th, 2547, 16 Starwood class light frigates finished their final assembly together at Sinovet Naval Yard AS9 Overreach. After two years of service, 15 of the 16 frigates were destroyed fighting lost battles during the Siege of Paris IV, the attack on Iota, and the fall of Arcadia. Receiving partial repairs and replenishment at tribute, in Amberclad, the one surviving vessel was reassigned to Lieutenant Commander Miranda Keyes on April 7th 2550, with the frigate being reassigned to the Sol System's home fleet. The Stowart class light frigate is one of the smaller classes of frigate in service with the UNSC Navy, at 478 metres in length, with a mass of 0.93 million metric tonnes. Stowart class frigates are protected by a 60 centimetre thick hull of titanium A armour. It is known that this particular permutation of titanium is titanium-50, as this is the primary titanium mined from planet Reach. It is a stable isotope of titanium with 22 protons and 28 neutrons, totaling 50 subatomic particles. The exact alloy of titanium is still unclear, but given the described performance of the armour plating regarding its ductility, suggested atomic mass and density, its thermal properties as well as its sheer strength and a handful of other parameters, I can say with a high degree of certainty that the alloy in question is an alloy called Grade 38. This is where titanium is alloyed with 4% aluminium, 2.5% vanadium and 1.5% iron which reduces the amount of vanadium needed as a beta stabiliser. Specifications of such is good cold workability and higher atomic density leading to superior ductility, 
which enables the plating to locally deform when struck by high velocity projectiles, rather than cracking completely, but also being very tolerant to high temperatures before structural integrity is compromised. The entire alloy is then molecularly strengthened to attain a condition known as single crystal superalloy. In most alloys, the microcrystalline structure tends to be arranged as islands of ordered atomic matrices, all meshed together into a disordered phase matrix. This results in a grain boundary between the different orientations of ordered metal crystals within the alloy. These boundaries result in areas of weakness in the material that high heat and stress can exploit and result in critical degradation of the plate's structural integrity in a process called creep. A single crystal superalloy has all of its atomic structures of the material in an ordered phase and orientation, equating to a single crystal throughout the entire material. This means there are no grain boundaries and no weaknesses to be exploited. The space between the armour plates is filled with shear thickening fluids, which are a non-Newtonian fluid containing suspended particles of ceramic. When a shear force is exerted against the fluid, the particles within the fluid form an almost instantaneous crystalline matrix hardening the fluid to 98% the mechanical strength of the associated ceramic material in the blink of an eye, thereby acting as a liquid armour, the induced crystalline matrix relaxing and returning to its normal viscosity nearly immediately afterward. This fluid also has an encapsulated healing agent to reduce spool from impacts and automatically seal hull breaches. This is all contained within a cellular hexagonal material that can be simply laid and attached to connection points within the inner hull surface. The plates are also generally embedded with thermal superconducting radiators to more efficiently transfer the heat generated by the ship into space. Unfortunately, this feature doesn't benefit the ship at all in reverse. When the plating is struck by sufficiently large plasma weaponry, the plates heat up and in particularly sustained attacks can become molten and boil away. The radiators don't help in dissipating the heat taken on board by plasma bombardment and generally the plates radiate this heat back into space gradually, but this is also accompanied by the internal air temperature spiking considerably in areas close to the impact zones of the plasma due to air's infinitely better conductivity of heat versus the vacuum of space. The titanium A plating can be layered with tungsten for a radiation absorbing rating of 5 and presumably grant greater protection against plasma weaponry. Unlike the Covenant's nanolaminate hull plating, titanium A plating is not effective during direct collisions with other vessels. The structure of the stalwart is built almost exclusively around its primary armament, the Mach cannon, since the Mach makes up well over a third of the length of the vessel overall, in truth, closer to 40%. The Mach and its charging capacitors make up the double boom arm 4 of the vessel. In this regard, it can be effectively considered as a Mach cannon with engines, with crew areas almost retrofitted to the ship's overall frame. The tandem boom arm 4 has, on either of its sides, two sets of pelican bays rotated 90 degrees from the orientation of the tandem booms. These then give way to a midship where the vast majority of the crew areas and habitable environments are located, along with the major operational facilities needed to operate the ship. Rear of this is the stern of the ship which is utterly dominated by the ship's reactor and engineering rooms, with the engines mounted within the cells that project outward from the centre of the stern. The ship features several hardpoints located along its length, and its main superstructure is a single, ultra-reinforced column running centrally through the vessel, onto which the boom arms, pelican bays and engine nacelles, support structures and everything else are effectively welded to, making the ship appear rather modular. Well armed for a frigate, the Stalwart class light frigate is equipped with a single 56A2 D4 Mark II light magnetic accelerator cannon, serving as the primary armament of the class. Stalwart frigates are fitted with 16 anti-ship M58 Archer missile pods. Warships usually carry large numbers of Archer missiles to complement their magnetic accelerator cannons. Archer pods usually carry around two dozen missiles each. Frigates and destroyers carry 30 pods, though larger ships carry more pods, sometimes hundreds. While individual archers are vulnerable to point defense weapons and have limited destructive potential, their sheer numbers make up for their lack of individual effectiveness. 
Covenant Shield technology can withstand large numbers of archers, though unprotected ships can be destroyed by archer missile strikes to the hull and superstructure. The M58 Archer is the preferred model of missile for the UNSC Navy, with most models of frigates and at least two classes of cruisers mounting these as their supplemental anti-ship weapon system. In addition to this, the Stalwart also boasts 76 long-range anti-fighter M340A4 streak missile pods mounted on the forward face of the engine nacelles. These frigates are armed with a point defense gun network mounted along the hull for tertiary armaments consisting of 6 M870 Rampart point defense guns and 52 710 Bulwark point defense guns. Each M870 Rampart is a fully automated hull based turret emplacement typically consisting of a battery of twin or quad mounted 50mm rapid fire core guns and a targeting scanner. Point defense guns such as these are used for the engagement of incoming threats including the warding off of strike craft and the disruption of plasma torpedoes. Each emplacement actively switches between sub-caliber armor-piercing sabots or proximity detonation fragmentation shells based on a threat analysis of its current target in order to maximize effectiveness. The Stalwart class light frigate is crewed by 250 sailors. In addition, these frigates also carry a complement of 200 marines and 64 orbital drop shop troopers. However, these frigates only carry 24 single occupant exoatmospheric insertion vehicles. The ODSTs that are deployed from the frigate via the SOEV drop pods are launched from the ship via a magazine fed coil gun accelerator. While the Stoward frigates lack the larger hangar bay seen on the Charon class light frigate, the class is outfitted with six hangar modules, each capable of launching or recovering only a single dropship at a time with the Stalwart holding a total of six D77TC Pelicans. Some Stalwarts have been known to also carry D96TCE Albatrosses, as well as the resident Pelicans, and the 12 M12 Warthogs and six M808 Scorpion tanks. Hull Section 1 is dominated by the double boom of the ship's primary armament a single 56A2D4 Mark II light magnetic accelerator cannon. A standard frigate mounted Mach averages at 183 meters or 600 feet. It can fire a 600 ton ferric tungsten projectile with a depleted uranium core at 30,000 meters per second and takes several minutes to recharge to full capacity between shots. The large amount of energy needed to fire the weapon is particularly onerous on a warship and the extended recharge time is a significant factor in combat against Covenant warships. As a result, Mach rounds are often fired at significantly below their maximum potential velocity by an order of magnitude or more. This results in the impacts being much weaker, but the Machs can be fired faster, and such firepower is sufficient to destroy the shields of most Covenant warships after a few hits anyway. The standard magnetic accelerator cannon is sufficient to destroy any human vessel or severely damage an unshielded Covenant vessel. The upper boom of the frigate contains the fire control systems and pulsed power storage for the Mac, and thus contains very little else due to the significant electromagnetic interference that would be generated with each shot. The Mac itself, which is fitted in the lower boom, also has to have considerable electromagnetic shielding. The Stalwart is noteworthy in its Mach positioning as it differs from all other frigate classes where the Mach gun itself is actually mounted on the upper boom as opposed to the lower boom. It is unclear why this design alteration was made for the Stalwart exclusively but it likely has something to do with the length of the barrel and its potential of having too close of a proximity to the bridge and other habitable areas of the central ship as well as the logistics of ammunition storage and movement on such a small vessel. The only other notable feature of hull section 1 is the reinforced telemetry and communications arrays mounted on the front of the ship, some of its archer missile pods and its various point defence systems with overlapping fields of fire. The most dominating feature of hull section 2 on the port and starboard at least is the two pelican bay modules. There are three pelican bays on the port and three on the starboard with the bay modules attached to the ship's superstructure, able to hold a total of six pelicans within the ship at any given time, with the forwardmost pelican in prime position to be dropped through a mechanized door via a heavy lift system 
into the launch system, allowing the Pelican to be dispatched out the primary forward-facing bay doors located here. The total of 12 doors that are apparent on the outer surface of the hull of the bay modules are likely used for smaller craft such as Hornets, Falcons and small shuttles, as they do appear significantly too small to fit the wingspan of a Pelican through them. That being said, I have in the past made a video to attempt to address a law scale problem that exists with regards to a disparity and in some cases incompatibility of sizes between smaller vessels and larger UNSC ships. If you'd like to learn more, the link is in the description. The next most dominating feature is the bridge of the ship, mounted high above the rest of the ship, granting the command crew good sight lines and perspective of the area around the ship. There were two consoles, which lined each side of the room and two in the centre, being that of the navigation and helm control. These officers were responsible for steering the ship at sublight speeds and executing slipspace transitions. The bridge has at least one tactical console station that is responsible for controlling and maintaining the ship's weapon systems. Auto cannons, archer missile pods and magnetic accelerator cannons launched and controlled by the tactical officers. There was likely an engineering console for the ship's operation officers. The ship's nuclear fusion reactors and other engineering functions are maintained here, and a final console being for communications. The captain or commander of the ship is seated centrally in the bridge with a large tactical map positioned behind the command station, which can provide a series of important pieces of information. The hollow tank for the ship's AI was also located near the captain's station along with a command console. The bridge of the Stalwart frigate has its own life support that will function even if the rest of the ship is crippled. Below the bridge, the locations of the living quarters, mess halls, barracks, cryo bays and engineering and access ways to the pelican bays can be found. Primary power conduits also run through this area to feed the MAC cannon the abundant levels of energy it requires for operation. Although not much is known of these areas of the ship, it is reasonable to assume they don't differ dramatically from that of the known layouts and functions of other frigate class warships such as the Charon. In the belly of the ship, the ODST drop bay, otherwise known as Hell's Waiting Room, can be found. Here, the 24 single occupant exoatmospheric insertion vehicles, or SOEV drop pods, can be found. The room is typically lined with two rows of drop pods. Each SOEV is poised over a tube that extends downward through the spacecraft's belly. In order to initiate deployment, a pod's operator must run a mandatory systems check, remove a series of safeties, and arm their ejection tube. Generally, the ship's fire control computer is responsible for ejecting the SOEVs at a trajectory that allowed it to drop into the correct entry path. A 30 second deployment countdown begins on the mark of the commanding officers of the unit. Afterward, the SOEVs fire quickly through the tube that runs down through the ship's belly. The drop pods are typically deployed from either a high altitude or from an exo-atmospheric location. They are either fired out of the spacecraft or soft ejected towards the world's surface until the pod breaches the atmosphere. This atmospheric insertion generates intense heat, hence the nickname of the drop bay being Hell's Waiting Room. Hull Section 2 also features numerous Archer missiles and overlapping point defence guns, as well as more communications arrays for localised communication, as well as radar and LADAR systems to assist the command crew in spatial and situational awareness. The Stalwart, as with the vast majority of modern UNSC warships, is powered by nuclear fusion reactors. In particular, it is powered by two primary reactors that feed nearly all of their energy into the thrusters and two secondary reactors which tend to be used for other functions of the ship. Nuclear fusion is one of the most significant breakthroughs in energy generation technology, taking two atoms of deuterium isotopes of hydrogen and fusing them together under high pressures via very powerful electromagnetic fields. The result is a helium-3 nucleus and the release of huge amounts of energy. In the primary reactors, the plasma medium generated by the reactors is almost entirely used for thrust and is channeled to the engine nozzles via large exhaust manifolds. The secondary reactors are instead used to power the ship's other functions. In order to do this, the plasma medium needs to be converted to a usable state. This is achieved via a process called electrostatic direct energy conversion. The fusion reaction occurs within the reactor chamber within a highly charged plasma medium. A selective leakage port on the reactor chamber opens and by means of magnetics and electrostatics, the ions and electrons in the plasma medium selectively leak from the reactor chamber and are directed into an expansion chamber. 
Here, the plasma medium containing the highly charged particles is guided and expanded in volume by a fan-shaped magnetic field that reduces the power density and converts the rotational energy of the reactor into directional energy suitable for energy conversion. The electrons are separated from the plasma stream and collected on an electron collector grid of varying potentials based on the variance in high and low energy electrons. This forms the negative terminal of the power source. Next, the ions are decelerated by retarding electric fields, kinetic energy is thereby converted to potential energy, and finally, the decelerated ions are collected on a high voltage electrode that form the positive terminal of the power. This method of converting raw nuclear fusion energy to usable electricity can be considered as a particle accelerator in reverse. The high energy particles in the chamber are decelerated to low enough speeds to be effectively and above all efficiently manipulated and converted. The Stalwart is equipped with a Starworks FTL 290C, a slip space drive featuring the Series 4 Coden field generator. The Shaw Fujikawa Translite engine functions by creating ruptures, referred to in some sources as wormholes, between normal space and an alternate plane known as slip space, also to be known as slipstream space and, in some cases, Shaw Fujikawa space. The engine creates ruptures by using high power cyclical particle accelerators to generate microscopic black holes. Because of their low mass, Hawking radiation gives them a lifetime of around a nanosecond, or potentially a little longer than a whole second before they evaporate into useless thermal energy. In that nanosecond, the engine manipulates them into forming a coherent rupture between normal space and slipstream. A major component of the drive is a set of slip space capacitors which have to be charged before a jump, drawing power from the ship's main reactors. The Shaw Fujikawa Translite engine generates a quantum field which prevents the ship and its occupants from being directly exposed to the 11-dimensional space-time of slip space instead translating the ship's presence to the foreign physics of slipstream space and squeezing it through the higher dimensions. This process requires constant calculations, with larger vessels requiring significantly more such calculations than smaller ones. For example, the slip space transition of a Phoenix-class colony ships requires 4.3 quadrillion calculations of quantum fields per second. The slip space drive doesn't actually accelerate a spacecraft through slip space, it is performed by the ship's conventional reaction thrusters. Thus, ships with more powerful conventional engines are also faster within slipstream space. When active, the Shaw Fujikawa Translite engine emits alpha and beta particles. The coordination and plotting of slip space jumps referred to as astrogation requires an enormous amount of calculations which require a navigational computer or an AI to successfully conduct, although they can be calculated by a human. For full details on the particulars of FTL travel and engines, see my two vlog videos titled Slip Space and Slip Space Engines. Again, links are in the description. Extremely mobile, the Starwart class is outfitted with two OKB Karman 56K fusion drives for sublight travel. The primary component of a fusion drive is an inertial electrostatic fusion reactor or a series of such reactors. The plasma generated by the reactors is channeled into a series of exhaust manifolds which vector it to the ship's engine nozzles. The drive exhaust serves as reaction mass, providing propulsion for the ship. The drive system also includes an exotic mechanism that utilises higher order manifolds to eliminate the otherwise devastating fusion backblast. These can be seen as glowing rings of concentric patterns within the thruster's nozzle. They serve to ensure that the massive amounts of energy the reactors produce and vector to the thrusters never builds up and backflows back into the reactor core, allowing any excess energy not able to exit the thrusters due to flow rate to be selectively leaked off via these conductive surfaces. As suggested by its technical name, the deuterium fusion reactor is powered by nuclear fusion reactions between deuterium atoms. Ability to deploy a concerted application of force across the far reaches of space and able to hold and advance strategic interests far behind enemy lines, the Starwart class frigates were vessels much, much more capable than their light tonnage. They pack a substantial punch in regards to armament, and the nimble and maneuverability during combat makes them particularly effective in fleet support operations and hit and run tactics. The Starwart class's most notable ship was called In Amber Clad and was commanded by Commander Miranda Keyes, daughter of Captain Jacob Keyes, one of the best naval officers in the UNSC. The In Amber Clad proved itself an exceptional operational asset, assisting the defence of Earth with the home fleet. 
the pursuit of the profit of regret, the discovery of installation 05, the security of the Halo's activation index, the death of profit of regret, and inadvertently, the fall of high charity to the flood. Up until its final moments on installation 05 as it was taken over by the flood, the Inamberclad gave great credit to the stalwart's reputation of being fast, powerful and adaptable against insurmountable odds. It is because of this that the Stalwart and many of its earlier design considerations were adopted by newer frigate classes. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Sotenchi, the silent cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Holden, Nathan, Red Sea, Darian and Neek, the holders of the mantle, Ty, Black Biscuit, J Rabbit, Austin, Kaiser, Silux, Reclaimer216 and the Revanche, my Reclaimers, Zack, Deep Cover, Verbal Statue, Spesigo, Spartan A498, Guppy, Josh, Mickey, Bastion, Molchar and Slithery, Tube Dude, my Metox and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome and all of this wouldn't be possible without you. If you like Halo Lore discussed to insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels including Discord, and if you really love the channel consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo related goodness. Take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>